Tonight's upload is brought to you by our patrons on the Patreon page. Allie Way, Bonanza Jellybean, Bree, Carl Eakin, Cecilia Spears, Allison Saib, Hawaii, Iron Alexa, Catherine McClear, Kristen Kay, Lauren Vaught, Liam Anderson, Michael, Ryan Woodward, Sean Campbell, William Schaefer, and Willow Ravenwood. Thank you all so much for supporting the channel on Patreon. And if you would like to support the channel through Patreon, click the link in the description below. Depending on the tier you select, you can get things such as free ebooks every month, a roll in audiobook narrations, free merch, and so much more. Patreon tiers start as low as two to five dollars per month. Also, in the description below, you'll find a link to our Facebook group page, our Twitter account, and our subreddit. And now, enjoy tonight's narration. Friday the Thirteenth, the novelization of the movie by Simon Hawk. Prologue. Night is the best time for stories. It's dark at night, what you can't see in the darkness you imagine. Sounds you don't hear in the daytime seem very loud, significant, and ominous. A slight rustling in the bushes. A faint creak on the stair outside the bedroom door. Perhaps it's only the wind. Perhaps it's only the house settling. Perhaps. But sounds at night can be disturbing. Noises in the darkness make the imagination see what the naked eye cannot. The imagination feeds on darkness, and it's hungry at night. It began as stories often do, around a campfire on a warm summer night. The time was 1958. The place, Camp Crystal Lake. Imagine log cabins set back in the trees, picnic tables, a small dock sticking into a lake, surrounded by deep woods, a few rowboats and canoes. There were a thousand places just the same. Summer camps run on a shoestring by small-town families. The Christies, in this case, nice people fond of kids. Places that remained locked most of the year, sitting idle, not costing any money except for a few months in the summer when the operating costs were small enough to allow for a little profit. Camp Crystal Lake wasn't one of those large, well-financed places with a fleet of paddle boats, a corral full of horses, and a small fortune in sporting goods equipment. No, it was just a small family-owned business, cheap to run, cheap to attend. A few cabins nestled in the pine trees on a lake, near a small town where the lower-income families could afford to send their children for a short vacation. Not a bad business if you're not looking for a lot of money. You hired a few older kids as counselors who doubled as the setup crew, arriving a couple weeks early to open the camp, turn on the water, and do a little maintenance. In return, they got the opportunity to roam in the woods, relax, and have a little summer fun. Perhaps even a little summertime romance, and you didn't have to pay them much. It beat the hell out of working as a fry cook at the local McDonald's. The counselors took care of the kids when they arrived, so you didn't have to do much. You didn't really even have to be there. Maybe in the early spring, you'd hire a plumber to replace some pipes that had frozen or cracked during the winter. Maybe you'd buy a new rowboat every few years some cots and outdoor furniture, all insignificant expenditures. The overhead was low. The time involved was minimal. The operation practically ran itself. What could go wrong? The camp had just been open for the summer, but it was going to be a short season. The counselors had spent the day sweeping and cleaning, doing a little bit of carpentry, hauling out the targets for the archery range, storing the supplies, most of the work was finished. They'd been at it for about a week, and none of them was a stranger anymore. If you had already grown close, that is. As they sat around the campfire singing, Michael, row your boat ashore, Barry hugged his legs and watched Claudette playing the guitar. The two of them were singing an altogether different song, one that did not require any words. Their eyes sent messages. Claudette finished playing as they sang of the last... Hallelujah. Hallelujah, milk and honey on the other side. Hallelujah. 
and wordlessly handed the guitar over to one of the other girls. Her gaze locked with Barry's. Barry stood and offered her his hand. She took it smiling knowingly, and they left the campfire as the group started singing, Hang down your head, Tom Dooley. Hang down your head and cry. The sounds of singing and the guitar receded as they walked through the darkness toward the barn. The crickets were also singing in the night. Claudette hesitated at the entrance to the barn, pulling back on Barry's hand. Somebody will see, she said. No, they won't. Barry tugged her gently by the hand, leading her into the darkness of the barn. He closed the door behind him and flipped on a light. As he turned, Claudette rushed into his arms. Their lips met in a long kiss. Does Mary Ann kiss as good as I do? Claudette asked coyly when they both came up for air. How would I know? Barry said a bit too quickly. Oh, you. Come on. He took her hand again and led her up the steps to the loft. Claudette picked up a worn woolen blanket. She paused, staring at him uncertainly. You said you were special, she said as if reading from a script used by countless young couples before them, performing the necessary motions of the courtship ritual. The unspoken agreement sealed with knowing gazes and lingering kisses. The token protest, the need for reassurance at the very last minute. I meant everything, Barry said, kissing her to prove it. Perhaps he really did but it was more likely he didn't and she probably knew it too. The physical need two people felt for one another was only the beginning. Sometimes it was an end in itself, a brief sharing of pleasure, and he had mutually fulfilled and selflessly taken. Sometimes it was only a catalyst for something deeper, a bond of real intimacy. But that kind of intimacy only came with time, and although they didn't know it, Neither Barry nor Claudette had much time left. As they settled down on the blanket they had spread on the floor of the loft, huddling close and holding one another, the barn door downstairs opened slowly. Soft footsteps made little sound as they moved towards the stairs. The music of youthful passion covered the sounds of the measured tread moving stealthily towards the steps. A faint creak, the footsteps hesitated, but no, no, they did not hear it. Oh, Claudette moaned, and then she stiffened slight as she felt Barry's hand fumbling with the zipper on her shorts. No, she said, catching his hand, but not really fighting. Come on, said Barry, his voice plaintive. His lips gently brushed her ear. A man's not made of stone. She giggled at that. Oh, please. She sighed as if with resignation and released his hand. Then her eyes widened as she saw a shadowy figure standing in the darkness at the entrance to the loft. Somebody's there. They both sat up in alarm, buttoning up and tucking in, smiling nervously and blushing, feeling self-conscious. Uh, we weren't, we weren't doing anything, Barry said quickly. He stood up as the figure in the shadows moved towards them. He smiled guiltily and shrugged. Hey, hey, really, we were just messing around. The knife plunged deep into his stomach. He gasped with pain and shock, doubling over, his hands instinctively going to the wound. The room started to spin and he fell back, landing on a roll of chicken wire, clutching his stomach. Warm blood spilled out between his fingers and ran from the corner of his mouth as life ebbed quickly. Claudette brought her hands up to her face and screamed. The killer came towards her, but it backed away, a gaze riveted to the bloody hunting knife, eight inches of steel streaked with scarlet. She could not tear her eyes away from it. She shook her head, unwilling to believe that this was happening. No! Please! No! Please! No! She whimpered, darting to the left, then to the right. But the killer followed her motions, blocking off escape, slowly closing the distance between them. She panicked and sought shelter behind a pile of boxes, 
grabbing them and throwing them, backing away, looking desperately for a way out. But she was cornered. She suddenly felt her back up against the wall, and there was no escape. She screamed as she saw the gleaming knife rise and stalk its swift descent. It was like a streak of fire across her chest. A burning, incandescent pain, more agonizing than anything she had ever felt. The blade bit deeply, ripping through her flesh, sinking in up to the hilt. It rose again and fell and rose and fell and rose and fell, over and over. Claudette wasn't screaming anymore, but still the killer hacked away like a runaway machine, and or the sounds of metal thudding into flesh and bone that came a distant sounds of singing from around the campfire. Hang down your head, Tom Dooley. Poor boy, you're bound to die. You've just listened to the prologue of Friday the 13th by Simon Hawk. This is an early access book, exclusive early access to Patreon. All early access uploads from Patreon will be put up on the YouTube channel two to three weeks after they premiere on the Patreon page. So, if you would like to have weekly uploads of Friday the 13th by Simon Hawk and other slasher novels to be named later, you can sign up on the Patreon page today for as low as 2 to $5 per month. Thank you so much for listening, and have a great night.